If Jesus was here in 2023, when, you know, times are evolving, he would evolve with them too. No, he would. What on earth? No, he would not. Is the Bible anti-woman? Do Jesus' teachings need to evolve with the times? Today, we discuss that and more as I interact with a video from a popular influencer. For those of you new to this channel, my name is Isaac David, and this is The Daily Disciple, where I equip you to follow Jesus daily. Now, as always, let's dive in. Religion is such a tough thing to talk about because I am the biggest supporter of believing in whatever it is that you want to believe in but in christianity i'm often told that that makes me not a true follower of christ and to each their own i know i'm going to get comments oh you're a fake christian i get them all the time there's a big difference between accepting somebody where they're at on their own journey versus giving them your wholesale approval of what they believe those are two very different things yes as christians we can come alongside people especially non-believers say hey like i want to encourage you towards the truth and maybe you don't believe all the same things i believe right now um you know, I'm going to stick around here. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to love you as best I can. Um, but it's not about saying, okay, hey, you know what? You believe what you want to believe and and that's chill and that's cool. And that seems like the opinion that this, this woman has. I just think she has a lack of understanding of what Christianity actually teaches. I don't say that to try to be mean to her, but I'm saying that when you look at the words of Jesus, they're very exclusionary. Like when you see Jesus saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. Or when he says, you're either for me or against me. That's not a message of like, you do you. It's like, believe in me or you will perish. Some people try to hold on to caricatures of Jesus as some sort of hippie guy that just wanted to promote free love and just was trying to teach the Romans and everybody to just love each other. And I'm just about being nice and being cool and being chill and maybe flipping over some tables at some times. But otherwise, man, he's a chill dude. Do you see Jesus, man? That dude. Yeah, he's him. OK, but let's look at a couple examples. You see Jesus interacting with the woman caught in adultery. Yes, he shooed away all the people, the hypocrites that wanted to stop stone her. And he said, you know, if you have not committed a sin, cast the first stone. They're all like, okay, we got to dip out of here. Everybody left. What did he do with the woman? He's like, okay, well, you know, you're chill. Like you're good. Keep uh, committing adultery. That's fine. No biggie. If that works for you. No, he says, go and sin no more. When he's talking to the woman at the well and confronting her over um, the, the many husbands that she's had or the many partners that she's had actually, you know, what does he say? He's like, okay, well, you know what? That's cool for you. Like if that works for you, that's all right with me because as long as you're happy with it, that's great. I don't want to judge. No, he says that you need to experience the living water that's only found in him to find fulfillment, not in these other relationships, not in kind of this, the sexual immorality that she'd been partaking in, but rather in God. It breaks my heart to see the deadly level of ignorance that people that call themselves Christians walk around with. They treat Jesus as just the, their mascot, but have no idea what he actually said. The way that I view Christianity is to live like Jesus, to love one another, to put other people first, and to love people as they are, genuinely as they are, support what it is that they want to do, what they need to do, what works for them, versus the kind of Christian who says, no, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, that, 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 that. That's not how I feel, and that's why this is my personal relationship with God. I absolutely agree in loving people where they're at. That is where we began 100%. What is the definition of love that she's talking about? Is it complete wholehearted acceptance and approval of every behavior and lifestyle that somebody might uh, take up? Or rather, is it saying, hey, like, I don't necessarily agree with all your decisions here, and, and I don't necessarily agree with your beliefs, but I'm your friend and I want to be with you and I want to care for you. And if you need something, let me know and let's talk and let's hang out. And, 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 and that's where you begin to love people. You begin to get into people's lives and you say, Hey, look, I, my, my, my love for you is not conditional on you changing right now. Like that's not what it's about. It's not a transactional relationship. I'm here to love you, whether you change, whether you don't change, whether you change your beliefs or whether you don't, that's not what it's about. I'm called to love you. And so I'm here without strings attached. The challenge is people so often conflate disagreement with hate. Not only is that a very unhealthy way to look at relationships in general, the idea that any kind of disagreement is immediate hate or an attack or anything like that. Like you wonder why relationships are so tenuous these days if people hold on to that opinion of love. No, I can love you well and boldly while still having a disagreement with you about something. Now I want to loop back to something she said. She talked about how she wants to live out the life of Jesus 
and to love people well as Jesus lived. If our Christian faith is contingent on our ability to live like Jesus and to love like Jesus, we will fall flat on our face every single time. If we see Jesus as just a moral teacher who taught us to love one another, then he becomes nothing more than a first century Jewish Mr. Rogers. But he is the king. We're called to submit to his reign, to receive redemption, to experience inner revival. I just want to give an example. Today I went to church and I was so excited to go to church. So many aspects of going to church that I love. I went all by myself. I worshiped on my own and it felt really good. We get into the scripture and the man who's preaching starts to say things that really get under my skin. I'm pulling out the notes. He starts to discuss things about how the woman was created for a man and women are the weaker vessel. They are fragile and they need men. And there's a difference in hierarchy, but that doesn't mean there's a difference in importance. Now, maybe I'm just a little too independent, a little too feminist, but I don't believe so. This is a doozy. This could get me canceled. Nah, I'm just kidding. If I was going to be canceled, it already happened. Now, I'm not an expert on this, as applies to most things, but I have read the Bible. So... Let's read it. In Genesis, we see the creation of Adam, the first man. And then in chapter 2, verse 18, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone, and I will make a helper fit for him. Now, there has been some contention over the word helper, and I'm definitely not a Hebrew scholar. But in looking up the word, you can see that it is used in uh, Hebrew to refer to God often, as he is our helper. So that being the case, we can determine that this is by no means a derogatory term or one that insinuates any kind of undignified role. But the scripture is pretty clear here. When God created Adam, he created him to take dominion and subdue the earth. Then he created Eve, equally created in the image of God, but created as a helpmeet to fulfill that mission. This is the big picture of marriage. This design is reiterated in the New Testament. Wives, submit your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. But don't think this is a one-sided affair. A couple verses later, it says, husbands are called to love their wives as Christ loved the church and laid his life down for her. Also, it's an important clarification to say that women aren't just called to submit to all men, but rather wives are called to submit to their own husbands. So we're beginning to see the big picture here. Man and woman both created in the image of God with equal value, dignity, worth, but assigned different roles in order to reflect God's glory. She brought up the verse of women being the weaker vessel, so let's read it. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So I was listening to John Piper's helpful perspective perspective on this, and he points out two important points to pull from this verse. Women do not share in the masculine strength that men have, but they do share unequivocally in being heirs with Christ. Men carry the burden and the responsibility to lead, to protect, to provide, while serving alongside their fellow heir with Christ. Now, there's been numerous debates about what it means to be a weaker vessel, but I think for most of us, at least on the base level, we can understand that the weaker vessel at least means that men are physically stronger, like the vessel of our body, men are more strong than women. I mean, this is pretty obvious, but when you look at the culture, you can see them deliberately kind of going against what God has designed, saying that, no, no, women are actually stronger and women are actually more capable in this area of protection. And when you look at any kind of modern superhero movie or movie in general, you're always seeing the woman beat up these big dudes and it just makes no sense, but everyone loves it in the culture, or at least the woke people do, because they're like, look, women can do it too. They're trying to shift the reality of the situation that ultimately men are stronger and that's part of the way that God designed it. But then we need to look equally and say, okay, well, hey, does this mean that men are above women in some context? It's like, no, we are equal heirs with Christ. Now, people have inferred as well that weaker vessel also includes kind of the emotional element and maybe even the spiritual element that men are stronger in both those capacities. And when you talk about the body, yes, the emotions are kind of connected with how we operate in our body. It's part of our vessel. So I could see that being applied to this as well, but I don't know where I quite line up on that. Now, this woman said that the pastor called women fragile. Uh, bad move, buddy. I don't see that anywhere in the scripture. And also when you call somebody fragile, like if you're calling all women fragile, you're kind of inferring that they're an object in some context, because I think it's like when you think of fragile, you're thinking of some sort of vase. Like you got to be real careful with it. Oh man, oh, it's going to shatter at, at any point. If you just, you know, let go a little bit. It's like, no, 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 not at all. Terminology like that opens the door for weird, like white knighting. Like I got to come in and I got to save you because you're in, you're fragile. 
fragile and you're a victim and, I, and I'm going to be strong and kind of save you in this kind of in this kind of context. And I just think that's not a super healthy way to look at it. Also, she talks about, okay, women needing a man. I know plenty of older women in the church that have just worked in missions their whole life that have never gotten married. And I, am I going to say, oh, you need a man, you should get married. It's like, no, dude, you got God, you're good, right? But those who do desire marriage and have that kind of sexual urge that is good to, to be, you know, fulfilled in the marriage context, that's great. Get married. And when you look at it, like Adam was the first one and he was the one who God said, well, hey, it's not good for man to be alone. So ultimately it was man who was like, hey, you probably shouldn't be alone first. It was that man needed a woman. Man needs the woman and the woman needs a man. And that's a beautiful thing that God has done in bringing those two people together so that they could serve him more faithfully. He continues to talk about, oh, I know a lot of people are going to be like, it's 2023. It's not like that anymore. But in here, the Bible stays the Bible, but it shouldn't. It's wrong. It's belittling. It's degrading. The idea that God's words need to be conformed to the world's idea of gender and gender roles is laughable because they can't figure out gender. They don't know what it is. Everybody can be a dude. Anybody can be a lady. It doesn't really matter. So the idea that we're going to take the solid rock and the foundation of God's word and all of a sudden say, oh, the times are changing. So I guess we should make some adaptions to it. You're going to make edits to the Bible every single day because it's constantly changing. It is absurd. They have no foundation. And so don't think for a second that I'm going to give that up. Don't think for a second that I'm going to deny the clarity of what God has given us and how right and how good and how complimentary it is to both men and women. No, it's not degrading. No, it's not putting down women. No, it's not treating them as objects. If you really read the scriptures and you really understand it, you begin to realize how much it lifts women up to a place of dignity and honor and how wonderful that is. Yes, men have twisted the scripture in order to abuse and control and manipulate, but the fact that we can point out that that is wrong from scripture means that God is by no means for it and is actively against it. I am not an object. I hope all of the women in the room felt what I felt because it was really just not cool. Jesus would not put up with that. That's what I said. That's what I wrote in here. If Jesus was here in 2023 when, you know, times are evolving, he would evolve with them too. No, he would. What on earth? No, he would not. Do not be conformed to the pattern in this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Why would you think Jesus would conform to the, the culture of nowadays when he didn't con conform to the culture back then? Are you think Jesus is going to come here and all of a sudden be like, well, he's just going to become some TikTok or e-boy? Like, no, thank you. He's not going to be conformed to the world he's going to be set apart i just wanted to share with you that you can be a christian who supports people who views all of us as one who doesn't label one person better than another and to me that's what it means to be a true christian this girl seems really nice and genuine like she really tries to love people but there's some crucial misunderstandings here are we all one yeah we're created in the image of god but until you are in christ until you put your faith in jesus you're still a child of wrath that's what the bible says you're rebelling against god you're dre dead in your trespasses and sins i totally agree with her when she says that christians don't need to portray themselves as better than other people it's like no 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 morally speaking no absolutely we are all sinners before god but there is truth and there is falsehood in terms of what we believe. It's not just about saying, you know, I'm no better as a Christian, therefore my beliefs, it, it doesn't really matter too much. You can believe what you ever, you want to believe. It's all good. No, no, no. We say, hey, yeah, I, I'm not a better person, but what I believe, I believe is true. And that's why I want you to believe it too. My heart for you is that you wouldn't just use Jesus as a label or think of him as a nice teacher and just try to love people and do nice things, but rather that you would repent for your sin and you would put your faith in Jesus and experience the transformation that he brings about, that you would now desire to honor him and, and love people and do that well, but all out of the transformation that you've experienced and the new creation that he is making you into, not out of a behavior heuristic, let me try to earn my way to God, or let me just incorporate some of these principles in my life because they'll be beneficial, but rather, man, this is the outflowing of my heart and I've been made new, so I want to love others well and share this hope with them too. Thank you so much for watching this video, guys. If you enjoyed it, subscribe because I'm putting out new videos all the time. I have a huge announcement. I am taking a group to Israel. Yes, it is true. I'm going with uh, my buddy, What Do You Meme? You guys might know that YouTube channel and uh, Brandon 
been sniped from that snipe life. It is very, very exciting. We're going to be going down there with a little group of us and you can join me there too. Hopefully it's not all filled up now, but you can check in the link in my description. Sign up today to go to Israel. It is in January of 2024. Going to be some teaching. We're just going to have a lot of fun. So if you want to join me, uh, hit the link in my description. I'll see you guys next time. God bless.